Hi, everybody. I'm Sharon Anderson, president of Lyle Mile Sarcoma Support and Direct Research, or LMSDR. And we're really thrilled today to have Dr. L here. And he's going to explain to us um, photo. Oh, I'll let him explain it. Here, Dr. L. All right. Thank you, Sharon. Photodynamic. And, yes. Yeah, thank you guys for all allowing me to do this. Um, so today we'll talk about um, photodynamic therapy, kind of the, its role in uh, metastatic leomyosarcomas. So, um, and as we go through, um, just let me know what kind of pops up for you. So kind of the big things, I, we'll go over first some kind of the background of Lyle Mayo, and I think you guys know more about that than most. We'll talk about the indications for PDT, what makes up PDT or photodynamic therapy, how it works, how this is different than a surgical treatment or a um, or chemotherapy, um, and then kind of the guidelines and the literature, just meaning where all of this is extrapolated from. The majority of stuff with PDT is related to, it was always, it was initially done, you know, and started in the 70s actually, um, kind of decreased in use, not for any particular reason, I think just more technology and then kind of had this big swing back into the nineties and then so on um, with lung cancers and esophageal cancers and then metas other metastatic cancers. And that's kind of what we'll, we'll focus on and then how that all relates. So just as Sharon and I and Leah were just talking at the beginning before this, you know, just in terms of the background about leiomyosarcomas, um, they're about, there's about 15,000 new cases of soft tissue sarcomas a year. And then leiomyos account for about 10 to 20% or about 1.4 new cases per 100,000 Americans per year. Um, obviously, it's, it's a rare malignancy, comes from the smooth muscle of the uterine wall, as opposed to other uterine cancers. Um, it's aggressive and with a high rate of recurrence um, and, and death, regardless of the initial stage of presentation, whether it's one, two, three, four. Um, and it ar arises from the myometrium, which is really the muscular wall, and then some of the connective tissue of the endometrium as well. And in most cases, um, it's made following the surgical diagnosis. So it's it's rarely made ahead of time, but it's it's diagnosed by the hysterectomy uh, or myomectomy for benign leomyos is what we typically think. So when people have endometriosis or uh, endometrial leomyos, they undergo surgery. This is where we typically find it is on the surgical um, pathology. Um, and just as one example from the literature, in one series, 106 patients with uterine sarcoma is about 65% of those were preoperatively diagnosed with a benign leomyo, and then were actually shown to have um, a leomyosarcoma. And so the sequence of events then that affects diagnosis, staging, and then therefore treatment with this. And again, typically postoperatively, it's rare that we find it in endometrial sampling or frozen sections. Um, it's usually end block or what we is what we call it, or by hysterectomy. Um, and there's no single test, whether it's imaging or lab tests that'll kind of point to this ahead of time. And so in terms of the, the initial surgical treatments, um, doing a, a salpingo uuferectomy or taking the ovaries at the time is often performed. It's usually, the data shows that it, it's typically done for uh, postmenopausal, perimenopausal uh, women, there isn't a whole lot of evidence to show that there's a survival benefit in premenopausal women to do this. And there's not a lot of evidence to, to suggest doing this um, afterwards either uh, when it's found on pathologic review. Sorry about that. I just wanted to move this over a little bit. Uh, and uh, so, Dr. L, we also yeah. have patients here who have LMS of the limbs and of okay. the uh, major uh, ventricles. And, yeah. okay. uh -huh. and, and that's where I'll kind of focus the next part of this. I just wanted to go over this initial part, oh, great. Um, just showing you this. And really what I wanted to focus on mostly was, as you see down here at the bottom, 
the 33% of people with newly diagnosed, the uterine, LMS, which is the ones we see a lot of, so stage four disease, and that's, as we were talking about earlier, the things that present with involvement of liver, lung, upper abdomen, um, and this can happen with any of these lyomyles. And so for early, and so early would mean, you know, here I say uterus limited, but this would also be limited to um, the initial organ, if it's soft tissue, skin, et cetera. Um, you know, stage two is really when it's outside of the uterus or outside in the pelvis still, but really the big focus here for us will be on this part, which will be, um, did I put it on this? I think I put it on this one, is really stage four or lyomyos to the uh, thorat, to the chest. So, Dr. Yes. L, we're, yes. we're not seeing the slides. We only oh. see Northside Hospital. Oh, geez. Okay. Um, I don't know why. Try. Huh. Let me try this. Is it coming up there? Yep. Now we oh. see it. Now, sorry. I had to switch screens. My, it's totally my mistake. So, this is really the important part um, is really talking about stage four Lyle Myos. Um, and, and again, the stuff I was talking about initially was really the uterine. Mm -hmm forms because that's where a lot of the literature is, but stage four for anything. So really anything that starts from its initial soft tissue site, uh, muscle, et cetera, and then metastasizes to the lung. So lung, liver, those are usually big places. And we'll kind of focus stage four and really thoracic disease. So for single, what we call oligometastatic disease with local recurrence, um, or limited disease, it's always been surgical resection has been the primary treatment. Um, it offers a, sur a survival advantage and is typically offered to as a first line treatment. Now, this is where kind of photodynamic therapy gets involved because the question was always, again, these are, this has always been done in small studies because a small limited patient population relative to other ones, but when you do metastectomies or meaning multiple resections, that's where we kind of get into the um, thoracic surgery world of kind of greater difficulty. So either large bulky lyomyles or um, if people have multiple lesions. So do you take out these lesions one at a time? You know, you essentially are taking out what we call a wedge which is kind of almost like a pie shaped piece of tissue that you're taking out. And as you do for people who have maybe multiple lesions, you're talking about taking multiple different segments out. And so in terms of treatment outside of that, the other big um, treatment for diseases has always been, again, there's not a, um, a standard chemotherapy regimen that's used for metastatic disease. It's typically first line is gemcitamine, uh, doxel, and that has, you know, its own set of side effects that go along with it. And I'm by no means an oncologist, but, you know, renal problems or kidney problems, liver problems with it. And then Yandalis is the other one for that's been, um, that is available or is approved for metastatic disease here. But again, this is for those who are, quote, not eligible for a surgical resection for these metastatic lesions. And it's given with palliative intent, um, but you have to have a good performance status. So that kind of is kind of the big parts behind what brought us to doing uh, photodynamic therapy. So in a similar light to lung cancers or other metastatic cancers, we started using photodynamic therapy, which or PDT. So what is it? So photofren itself, is it's just an iron-based um, medication. Um, it's an inert molecule or inert medication. Um, it was initially used in endobronchial non-small cell tumors um, in those patients, again, whose surgery, or in this case, radiotherapy, um, couldn't be used. And again, as that relates to Lyomas, Gus are probably all aware that they aren't real resp responsive to um, radiation. Um, so photofren is used for the destruction, ablation, and palliation of symptoms uh, for people who, for complete or partial obstruction of endobronchial lesion, high-grade dysplasias and esophageal cancers, 
um, who couldn't undergo, again, a surgery, an esophagectomy. And then palliation for those patients who had complete had esophageal cancers that are completely or partially obstructing. And they couldn't be treated with what's called a YAG laser, which is just basically a um, it's a high powered laser. Imagine it's almost like using an acetylene torch, uh, which we use a lot of times to cut out tumors. When, but you know, again, it's um, when we worry about the thermal injury there or the chance of penetration into other structures, we try to avoid these things. So, kind of the I'll, I'll break this into kind of the big three components of PDT or photodynamic therapy. So, as I touched on first, we have photofrin which is the medication. And so um, it, you can see kind of down here, these little vials, they're an inert medication. It's a lyophilized or powder. It gets reconstituted um, and then infused. And the infusion itself, it's, there's typically, it says here two milligrams per kilogram of body weight. In general, one vial for about a 70 kilogram person um, will suffice. Um, and again, it was initially approved by, in the, by the FDA in 1995 for esophageal cancers, endobronchial cancers, high-grade dysplasias, and that's as a first-line therapy. Before that, it was used, but it was typically uh, second, third lines for these other cancers. So it's just mixed essentially with, um, you know, in a 5% dextrose water solution, no different than any other IV, and it's given over about three to five minutes. People go into an infusion center, they get infused, and then we let that medication circulate um, for about 48 hours. So the second component is this laser. And I tell people um, with this laser, really, it's like the world's most powerful pen light, is what I'll call it. So what happens is photofrin gets activated under a certain wavelength of light. So it's 630 nanometers that you see up here. What happens is we program the laser, and it Turn, we turn it on, it has a little aiming beam. And what we'll do is, and I'll kind of show you pictures of it. We put it into the tumor, you turn it on, you treat for a certain amount of time. And what happens is the photofrin gets activated and then it starts to kill the tumor in that area. And then the third part of that is these little flexible fibers that go through the scope. And these are all done through bronchoscopes. So bronchoscopy, um, is really, it's just, oscopy just means scope. So it's no different than if you've ever had an endoscopy or colonoscopy, but as I tell people, my scope is much smaller. It's about the size of a pen head and it goes into the, the airway. And so I'll, we'll typically do these under general anesthesia. So someone's completely asleep. And so those are kind of the big components. So again, the photofrin itself, it gets injected. And as I was saying about 40 to 50 hours um, after the injection, patient comes in for the first light application. So we give it about 48 hours, two to three days uh, to infuse. So you'll see me in the next couple of slides just to kind of set those up. I'll refer to things as being day one, three, five, seven, meaning it's from the infusion. So we'll infuse on day one. Um, typically, we we'll, I like to use Fridays um, just because the person, the patient comes in, they get infused, it takes about 10 minutes, they get the medication, they go home. Uh, they come in on Monday and we do the first part of it, which is the light application. So it'll be under general anesthesia. We put a breathing tube in, we go to where that tumor is, we put the, um, the laser into that spot and it can be embedded in the tumor, done around the tumor. We treat it for a certain period of time, anywhere from five minutes to eight minutes. Um, you can treat it in different parts of the tumor, and I'll kind of show you what that looks like. And then you're done. Take the um, the fiber out, the scope out, person comes off the ventilator, and what happens is the medication's activated there, and then it starts to kill the tissue, and then like this. So as you can see here, this is just an example of how it penetrates through tissue, in this case, a skin uh, an example of skin lyomyo or soft tissue of, of the um, of the skin, depending on the wavelength of light, it really certain amounts of light will be reflected. The rest will kind of penetrate and get absorbed into the tissue. 
Now the depth of penetration, these have kind of don't really worry about this part on the left. It's really, um, it kind of gives us an idea of how long and how far, and that's what's helped us kind of figure out the amount of time. The big thing or the, I think the interesting picture, big take home message here is here's, if you think of this, and I don't know if you guys can see the pointer on here. Um, this is the fiber coming out. At the end of the fiber, the light kind of gets dispersed, not as a point, but almost, it's almost a sphere of lights. Um, and if you think of it that way, when you put it into the tumor right at the point, you get light exposure in 360 degrees. So not just at the exact point, but the light will scatter out, as I was showing on that other picture, in 360 degrees. So you kind of get tumor death all through there and activation through there. So it it rather than it being a point, it's more of a sphere going in there in terms of the amount of energy. And what that all kind of comes back, this is just kind of a, a cartoon rendition of it. So that red light or that wavelength of light at 630 nanometers, it activates that photofrin and that photofrin goes through a chemical process and it causes cell death um, and it causes tumor cell death in that area. It causes the blood vessels to constrict and you get more death there and then lysis or death um, of those cancer cells. Um, and it's all localized to that area. So although the medication is taken up everywhere in your body, it's only going to get activated in the areas that, um, and cause death only in those areas. Now, as I was kind of talking about that time where I said one, three, five, seven days, this is kind of just, a, again, a little schematic about it. One Day one is that Friday where you get infused. You come back on a Monday, we do that initial treatment. Well, now that tumor starts, you go home or some people get admitted to the hospital. It really just depends on the type of case. You come back after two days. So this day five is like, think of it as Wednesday. You come in and you see a lot of dead tissue and we will debreed that. And debreeding is just taking it out mechanically, freezing it, flushing it out. And then you'll treat again, um, a second light application in the same area. And then you come back two days later on that seventh day, you clean out that bronch again. Now, some people, if they've had um, really good responses, I might treat them again and have them come back, you know, another 48 hours later if they need to. Um, but it's really just to get more debridement. Now, the the reason we kind of focus on this first week or this first seven days is that's really where your, your biggest bang for the buck is, so to speak. Um, you get your biggest exposure response here. Over time, photofrin will decay, which is what we want it to do. So it washes out of your system. You could come back after two weeks and do this again if you wanted to, but it'll usually, um, you'll get less of an effect. And so that's why, but you'll also have less of the kind of side effects that we ever work about or talk about. So kind of contraindications, and these are fairly rare. People who have prophorias, which are um, diseases of the liver where you have problems um, processing iron. Obviously, we wouldn't do it. Um, people who have uh, what's called a tracheoesophageal or a fistula, so a hole between the lung and the esophagus or the windpipe in the esophagus. So anything where we worry that you can create a hole. Um, now, one of the benefits of photodynamic therapy, as opposed to some of the other things I showed, like that YAG laser or that kind of a settling torch model is this is a little more um kind of slow to to work as you see it takes over a week to do it but it's also a little more controlled so you can kind of control how much you're uh, burning in an area so the risk of creating these fistulas is much lower um, obviously if you have a big blood vessel like the aorta behind it you don't want to do this or any of these things really um, people who are severe respiratory distress, obviously these are issues and then anything that's emergent. So if someone had something where their airway was obstructed and they needed treatment right this second, this is not going to be the first tool I reach for. Um, and it's not su suitable for people who have, um, in the esophagus, um, who have bleeding history of kind of, uh, bleeding blood vessels. Um, and it, this is kind of along the same thing. Um, 
And then in terms of these guidelines that I put here is really, um, really just to point out that it is a grade one uh, recommendation for not just lung cancers, but any cancers that have been um, that are have um, migrated or are metastatic to the lung. So it can be done no different than it, and then any of these other th brachytherapy is just where we do radiation therapy, localized electrocautery or freezing it. So it's in the same grade. So one C, one is uh, recommendations are um, have good evidence. C just it's A B C. So there's uh, if you think one A has absolute evidence and four C is essentially flipping a coin. This is one C, so it still has a lot of excellent evidence to for its use. Um, again, just as as I kind of mentioned, um, it's used in CIS. Just means carcinoma in situ or things that are superficial or deeper, um, and then it can be used in in other stages three A B. These are for lung cancers, but for us and what we're talking about, these will all be stage fours, but can be treated as lung cancers are in stage three. And that just means that it's not always for palliation. It can be used for curative intent. And again, this is just to give you, it treats the full spectrum from invisible disease or that superficial disease all the way to big tumor that's obstructing an airway. Um, now, one of the benefits of uh, PDT also is that it can be used in conjunction with chemotherapy um, and immune therapy at the same time. There's a lot of evidence to show that it actually has a synergistic effect or works to enhance those responses. Um, so there doesn't have to be kind of a time lag. So if some if a patient is on chemotherapy or is on immune therapy, this can be done at the same time because it's a, a fairly inert molecule, it doesn't interfere or interact with any of those things. Um, so that's never an issue. Um, oops. And then, and again, it can be used as part of that multimodality the theory. It can be used with, um, for endobronchial tumors, it can be used before chemotherapy, after. Um, you see this little asterisk here for radiotherapy or radiation. It can be used with radiation. It's just the timing. Um, and this is a more of a theoretical risk of the conversion of energy from uh, light energy to thermal energy that you don't want to have too much thermal energy because you could have potential burn. We really, um, that's an easy kind of fix for us, which is, uh, which is just, we do want, we do them within two weeks of each other. So if you had radiation, Today, we're going to wait about, or you completed your radiation today, we're going to wait about two weeks before we do PDT. So it's not, it's not a big um, difficulty. The only other thing I would say here in terms of contraindications or really risks, um, and I think some of the patients can speak to this more than I can, is the biggest thing is because you have this photosensitivity um, in these areas, um, you can get photosensitivity because this this wavelength of light is in natural light as well. So, <coughs> excuse me. So what I tell people is, um, as it washes out of your system, as I was saying earlier, we just have people for the first 30 days after they get infused to be careful with light exposure. And that means they give you this lovely floppy hat, sunglasses to kind of prevent that. Um, and, and we tell people wear long sleeves, um, gloves if you're out initially. And then over time, you start to bleed the light in. And we kind of go over all those things when it's time to treat or where we're setting people up. But it's it's not the world's biggest inconvenience. I'm in Atlanta, so people always worry that, oh, can't do it. You know, there's sunlight all the time. I've had people all over the country who get treated um, and they do fine with this. And so just kind of the last thing I think I wanted to go over here was I put a little case in here of a patient that I had, 69-year-old time, metastatic lyomyo, had an obstructing mass in the left upper lobe, previously treated with chemo, and then had 20 cycles of radiation before she came to see me. And at the time, her tumor was about nine centimeters, and there was both tumor that it was obstructing 
um, from the outside, extrinsic compression as well as intrinsic, so tumor in the airway itself. And just to kind of give you guys an idea, so over here, this is your right lung, this is your left lung, and this is the tumor here and extending here, and this is where your the airway should go all the way out to the upper and lower parts of the lung. You can see it's here, but it gets narrow. It gets squished kind of going out here and it gets squished kind of going out here right at this kind of fork in the road. And so just a little cartoon example of that is we actually showed that when we looked at it, there's tumor here and then there's tumor in the airway. And so that's why PDT was a, a great choice here because we could treat this tumor that's in the airway and then embed it into this tumor through this wall and we get that 360 degree treatment where we might not get that with other things to start killing the tumor in these directions as well. So what that looks like is, so just again, to give you perspective, this is that going up to that upper part of the lung that I showed you. And this is going to that lower part. And this is all tumor here. And this tumor goes all the way back. That's that big part that's there. And then this is that kind of that little dumbbell so to speak. So this is the little part, and then the big part is behind the wall. And so we went in there and we used, depending on what type of tumor, so we still use that photofrin, and this is just to say what type of tumor, the fibers that we have, we call them flexible or rigid. They're all really flexible. It's all a relative term. Um, and how stiff it is to embed it in the tumor, put it next to the tumor. So we treat it initially across it, so essentially laying that fiber that you saw across the tumor, treated it with a certain amount of energy. And so then we come in here. So this is our Wednesday. So first picture. So that big tumor that you saw, it's not the prettiest picture, but this is all dead tissue. So we go in there and we start pulling it out, freezing it, cutting it. And then this is that fiber. And you can see the light here. This is for that second treatment. So this is like our Wednesday morning, we take this out and then right after it, treat like this. And then we come back and treat again. And then I debride again. And then this is what it looks like when we're completely done. So just trying to give you, I should have done a good side by side comparison, but you can see this compared to this. So we went from here to here. And this is just initially. Now you can see the airway is completely open going up here. And again, one of the biggest parts with this treatment or anything in this is that it's it doesn't have to look pretty, but it's opened the airway. So now we have functional airways, you know, beyond all this and below this. Because before you saw in that CAT scan, that area was really smushed down from outside. And so then kind of follow up at three months, it's decreased in size. So now CT a few months later, it's decreased in size. This looks slightly higher cut. That's why you don't see that airway going here. But you can see these little areas here where they're black. That's where all that tumor is dyed and there's actually airway going through there and there's air moving through it. The reason it's so flat right here is because the tumor that is below it is all dead. And this is kind of along what's called a fissure or a break point in the lung. So oh, that was amazing. And I actually could follow it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so we this, can have questions. Yeah. And then this is um, the phone number. The phone number at the bottom is actually my um, coordinator's number for the interventional pulmonary program here and email. So if you have question, other questions that you want to email to, that goes to her and then she just gives them to me <laughs> to answer. So, um, but doctors refer through this, uh, patients can, however. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions. So let's see, you could put your questions in the chat or you can just unmute yourself and ask your questions. Either way is fine. May uh, I ask Dr. Dr. L, I have a question. Um, are there yeah. any other hospitals like in the Midwest uh -huh. that perform this? Um, yeah. There are, there's plenty. Uh, we were just talking about that. I had a patient from the Midwest um, at, who I have a good friend who trained, We I trained and he works up there. So I have a, we have a whole network of doctors who do this all over the country. Okay, thanks. I'll look into it. Thank you. Yeah, 
absolutely. If you tell me what part of the country, you can email me. Chicago, Milwaukee, that area. Uh, I have friends in both cities who do this. Okay. Um, so I'm happy to, yep, just I can send you whatever information you need. Right. So there's some questions in the chat. How small of a tumor can you do this with? <laughs> um, it really depends. Um, I just recently did a patient who had one large tumor and then had some smaller tumors that were uh, so small that they didn't need to be debrided, that they were just killed by the, the laser and we just let it slough off. And they were down to less than a, a centimeter or, or smaller. It really just depends on, on the patient. I have some patients who, um, what we really do with a lot of these things is we follow them and we have some other newer stuff that we're doing now to kind of localize for multiple lesions. Um, so if you have multiple tiny lesions, sometimes we follow them and then over scans. And if they, they start to get big or people have symptoms, then we treat them there. Um, one of the benefits of PDT also is we can always go back again. There's not a, a dose limit in terms of treatment, meaning we can treat now, we can come back in a couple of months, treat again with a reinfusion, um, you know, three to six months, that's not an issue. Uh, it's not like radiation where you get irradiated to the chest for something and you can't have more radiation later in life. So, but yeah, I've done them down to a centimeter or less. Right. Uh, someone asked, what if you have CML, which I'm not sure what that is. Uh, oh, so myelog uh, chronic myelogenous leukemia. These aren't typically used for CML lesions. Um, there's not a lot of evidence in lymphomas. Um, most lymphomas respond to chemotherapies. So these are, this is typically used for solid tumors, or if you think of tumors that are very vascular or have big blood supplies to them. Okay. Can it be used in other parts of the body, like the liver or the skin or, um... uh, so it is used, it is used in the skin. It's not been used in the liver, um, just because part of it is, a way to debreed or a way to kind of control that. So in the airway or the esophagus, um, you have tumor that dies in the esophagus, it's just going to go down the GI tract and you're going to expel it. Um, in the lung, we're able to suction it out or cut it and take it out. In the liver, if you kill something like that, you're kind of killing something blindly. So it hasn't really been done. In the liver, it's typically what's called RFA or radiofrequency ablation is used in it yes so how many lms cases has this been used for are there reoccurs reoccurrences of los which i'm not sure what that is um so total cases that have been done i can't say off the top of my head for me particularly i've done probably a half dozen or so okay and uh, does MDA offer this? MDA. What's MDA? Sorry. MD Anderson. Uh, MD Houston. Anderson. Oh, MD Anderson. Uh, probably. Um, I'd have to look at who's there, but probably. Uh, most places that have an interventional pulmonary program do. I know, um, you know, so. Okay. What about other countries like the UK? Is it available there? Uh, you know, I, I don't know. Um, I know that the parent company is based out of the UK. So I think that it, hopefully that it is, but I don't know much about the UK health system and how things work there. Okay. Could you use it on the pancreas? Uh, again, typically it's not used in the pancreas just because, you know, depending on with pancreas, uh, cancers, primary or metastatic, it's usually a surgical resection. Um, and it, because of where it is in terms of the blood supply, um, the risk of penetration or into a, a big blood vessel where you can't control something like that is, is the biggest issue. Okay. And can you do both lungs at the same time? Yes. Okay. Is there a greater um, risk of lung collapse by doing both? Uh, it really time? just depends on the tumor size and how, you know, it's a case by case basis. Um, there have been some where, yes, we've done one side for tumors and then come back and done the other. Now, with some of the things we're doing with robotics, we can do both sides at the same time. Um, it really just depends. Okay. And um, 
Have you had LMS patients whose nodules have been resistant to this? Um, so I haven't. Um, the biggest uh, key with all of these is really response, whether it's LMS or any other tumor, is just the vascularity. Um, you know, if there's large blood supplies, then people tend to do or have a bigger response. There's okay. a bigger risk of spread, but there's a bigger re response, meaning spread, meaning before we get to it. All right. What about cryoablation freezes? But is this similar? But with uh, light? So we use cryoablation with it. So cryoablation, yeah, it's just basically liquid nitrogen. So we do it. We use liquid nitrogen actually in that picture I think I showed you here. Um, over here on this left side, I used cryo to take out all of the stuff and then before treating again. So you can do it with cryo. That's not an issue at all. Um, cryoablation, you can do it as well. Some people do what's called spray cryo, which is almost like a, a spray paint can going through there where you spray it uh, and freeze everything in the area and then kind of take it out in pieces. The one, one of the other benefits here, oh, so cryoablation is great. It's, uh, imagine it's almost like, again, using like liquid nitrogen on a warts. You, you freeze it and then you pull it off, but that tends to bleed. So with PDT, before you do that, it kills all the blood vessels there so that when I freeze it and pull it out, they tend to bleed less. Okay, great. Any possible side effects in the lungs and what's the recovery time? Yep. So the biggest side effect, it, not in the lung itself, in the lung itself, the, potentially you could have what's called pneumonitis. Itis is just inflammation. So depending on the amount of energy you use in a tumor, and that's usually decided ahead of time. If somebody, um, if you decided to, let's say, use a higher energy source or they had a bigger reaction, they may get some inflammation in the lung, um, notice some wheezing, coughing more. And and usually it's treated with steroids. Okay. So are there blood clots? Are blood clots a concern after treatment? And after treatment, do you cough up stuff? Uh, so in terms of blood clots, so anytime you have any malignancy, you're at increased risk to develop blood clots, oh. but typically not more so with the treatment. And this won't create blood clots. Um, we kind of, I tell people all the time, it's kind of the separation of, the term, quote, blood clot, as in clot you're forming when something's bleeding and you form a clot, just like a scab, versus blood clot like a pulmonary embolism or a deep vein thrombosis in a blood vessel, uh, which can you hear about and where people are on blood thinners. So all that is to say, are you at risk to develop those blood clots in the lung? No more so by doing this than if just by having LMS or any other malignancy. Okay, great. Do you cough up stuff? Yeah. So again, as I was kind of saying that you have, you know, it's the, I joke that it's the gift that keeps on giving in the sense that once you kill this tumor and we do it over that week, you're still going to have activation of that medication and continue to have tumor that dies in those areas. So people will you know, I try to clear out as much as I can, but you'll still have some death of tumor in that area that might be left or tumor that we've killed and just haven't, you know, pulled out because we don't want it to bleed more. And then people will notice that they're coughing out more mucus, which is really, or they'll say it's dark mucus and it's usually dead tumor. It sounds disgusting, but it's effective. It's getting rid of the tumor. Okay, great. And Kathleen wants to know, have you seen a recurrence with LMS? Um, so in the patients that I've had, we, you know, we've followed them. Uh, most are on um, two therapies, meaning we've done PDT while they're also getting chemotherapy or immune therapy. Um, there has been progression in other parts of the body, but I haven't seen a whole lot of progression in the lungs. Um, they've been relatively stable of those that we've done. Yeah, great. Well, typically, just like any other LMS um, early stage, once we treat, we'll continue to follow, you know, with serial exams monthly, you know, over X number of months and then over X number of years. Okay, would this treatment be in conjunction with chemotherapy? It can be, absolutely. And for those patients who, let's say, cannot tolerate chemotherapy, this is often a, a good option. Okay, or what about tumors in the muscle? Can you uh, use it for that? So 
I don't do tumors in the muscle. Those are typically resected um, as a first line therapy, because again, you want to get the body of that tumor out in that situation. Okay. Do you have telemedicine appointments to see if you're a good candidate? Absolutely. I do. Okay. So let's see what else I can pull up here. Um, any other questions? And reminder, you can unmute yourself to ask your questions. How about hearing from Leah? What was it like to have this procedure? Well, Leah, are you still with us? There you are. I'm here. I'm here. Um, all I can say is it's the easiest cancer treatment I ever had. Um, all I was left with was a little bit of a sore throat. And actually, Dr. L, you must have gotten most of the gunk out because I did not cough up very much stuff, to be honest. So um, to me, it was super simple. I highly recommend it to anybody. And the results are fantastic. Um, I'm still stable today. And um, there is some hypermetabolic activity on my PET scan, but nobody's even sure if that's actually cancer. So, um, you know, I've been doing great. And uh, I tease Dr. L and tell him he's my hero because he kind of is. It's um, after that treatment, I've been doing great. So highly recommend. All right. She's your poster girl. Yep. <laughs> She okay, did all anybody parts. else have it who wants to speak up? I think Mel had it. Uh, yes, I did. Uh, it's about a month and a half ago. Uh, it, 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 it's, you know, compared to this. I play this job to uh, Dr. I. I said, what you did took me about a six round of the very far she came. You know, like the red dev devil. I did that very hard chemo, but the result yeah. of the same just for a couple of days. Just a, a, a few days ago, I, I, I actually, I, I texted Leah and said, Leah, I just coughed out a lot, a lot of bad stuff. I think those are bad cells. Yeah, it's great. It's been That's great. good. You're getting them out. Yes. That's what we want. Okay. So it's, Anybody else have it done that wants to speak up? Okay. Steve Dupree asks, where do you enter the lung? Uh, so we go through the airway and I'll show you kind of the, so from this picture, what we do is you can see this. So this is your windpipe. So we put an endotracheal tube or a breathing tube in just like any surgery. So you're completely asleep. And then I put a scope through there and then can guide it to whichever part of the lung I need to go to. Okay. And we can go out with the scopes that we have and some of the technologies, we can go out into the smallest airways now. So almost out to the periphery. Wow, okay. And that's how you got your sore throat, Leah. <laughs> yeah, okay. It's usually the breathing tube because we, that is one of the things, cause we, you know, you intubate or put someone on the ventilator three times. So that's, three times of that tube going through the vocal cords. Um, so that's what usually causes it. But I think Leah or Mel can tell you it's, you know, it's usually you find yourself clear in your throat, might be sore for a couple of days, but usually clears up pretty easily without any other intervention. That doesn't no sound bad to me. Okay. So Kathy Reb says a video I watched showed that sometimes the body recognizes these bad cells as cells that shouldn't be there. And our own defenses recognizes that they die, recognizes them and then they die. Yes, I think. Yeah, I mean, that's part of cancers in general is that part of it is the body doesn't recognize self um, tissue. And so you get this overgrowth. So all of our cells just kind of big picture overview of, of cancers are every cell has what we call programmed cell death. So within our kind of genetic makeup, cells grow, they differentiate or know what type of cells to become. And then they have a certain life expectancy and then they die. Now, everything from benign tumors or even moles have overgrown to some degree, but then 
certain cancers that are malignant, then they keep growing and keep growing. And then they, they lose that quote differentiation. So the body doesn't recognize them. So it's really the rate of growth and death that they have um, mm -hmm. that causes that. Okay. Um, how about recurrent LMS tumors in the pelvic area near the bladder? Can you do that? We don't treat those. Those are typically treated um, when it's a recurrence like that. It's usually surgically resected. And then some people, it'll be chemotherapy. Um, again, one of those lines that we had talked about. But And that's why making that first surgical um, decision, you know, whether it's um, just uterus, uterus plus, um, uh, what's it called, uh, ovaries, or, you know, depending on what else is involved in the pelvis. Okay. Lee, here's a question for you. <laughs> Lee, How long have okay. I been stable? Well, let's see. I was 69 years old, <laughs> so three years. <laughs> I guess I just gave away whose case study that was, huh? Um, so, yeah, it's about three years now. Are you NED or... You have stable disease. Stable disease. Okay. Well, again, they they the um, metabolic activity in the lung is not clearly defined. So at this point, we don't know because my lung had collapsed. We don't know whether it's actually disease or something else. Dr. Okay. L can tell us it could be lots of different things. Yeah. And that is, well, since... Lee gave that part up. I will tell you that this <laughs> was, I don't think it's a HIPAA violation now, but this is, this is a nine centimeter tumor. And so when we debride this, yeah, you have some death. And, you know, again, just as I was saying with uh, any tumor, you get programmed cell death or this tumor doesn't have anywhere to grow. So it will die. And when you have a PET scan that lights up, really the, all that a PET scan is, is, what gets infused into you is just a radioactive sugar molecule. So anything that has uptake or has more activity will, will light up. So the same way I tell people the, you know, when you sign the PET scan form, when you go to get it done and all those, that fine print, that's all through there that no one ever reads what's in there is it says, you know, if you're sick, have an upper respiratory infection, postpone your PET scan. Um, if you have, you know, if you don't work out, don't drink coffee, all those things are in there because any one of those things can raise your metabolic activity. So it's really, you know, comparing it, yes, we compare it um, and it kind of gives us an idea, but, um, you know, tumors might light up X amount. Um, infections can light up. And so it's really in the context. So I tell people, I always want to compare apples to apples so I want to compare your PET scan to your PET scan, um, you know, oh, to discuss, you know, stable disease, but it's also that PET portion. Also, there's a CT portion. So even if there's more activity, it's, is there more activity and that mass is smaller or bigger or the same size? So that all kind of tells us different things. So again, kind of the, the Reader's Digest answer I give people is always, you know, there's usually infection inflammation, tumors. Those are kind of the three big ones that can cause a PET scan to light up, but not all of us. Okay, good to know. How does someone decide between PDT or RFA? So I, I think that's a decision you make with your oncologist um, and or your um, pulmonologist or interventional pulmonologist, uh, cardiothoracic surgeon. Um, in general, again, these are a lot of cases that we'll discuss. Um, most hospitals will have, or cancer programs will have a multidisciplinary uh, conference. So we have ours every week. People present cases, whether it's oncologists, surgeons, pulmonologists, whomever, and say, this is what I have. You know, what are treatment options? This is the patient's um, what's called ECOG score, or how stable are they? Can they tolerate? And one of those you know, contraindications I said in there was, you know, can you tolerate surgery or can you tolerate general anesthesia? Could you tolerate a bronchoscopy? If a patient's so frail that they couldn't tolerate those things, then this isn't, you know, 
the best option, whether it's this RFA, um, and then there's some other treatments out there as well um, that are being done, you know, in these situations, so. Okay, would you say PDT is available at most major cancer centers? Um, yeah, I, you know, the majority of, you know, definitely interventional uh, pulmonary programs have PDT. PDT, again, is, it's a tool um, that we utilize. So whether it's this or a laser or, you know, cryo or any of these other kind of techniques to debris a tumor or treat a tumor, it's just what do you have and what are you comfortable with? You want to find a place or one, someone that you're comfortable with Two, you want to find somebody who, you know, not necessarily the 800 pound gorilla, but somebody who does a lot of cases. If they say, yeah, I've done it, but I've never done a case in my life, or it's been 20 years, or, you know, maybe other options that they offer are better in those situations. So it, it really depends. And it's something that I think, as, as I tell all my patients, it's never a decision I make. It's something we make together. Okay. And uh, let's see, what else is in here? Has anybody had a terrible reaction to photo friend? Uh, knock on wood, I've only had one, um, and that patient, and he doesn't mind me telling the story, I told him repeatedly, um, you know, got to be careful, don't go out in sunlight, said, you know, even if it's cloudy outside, it's still out there, you have to be careful until sundown, well, he's a football coach, and he decided to coach under Friday night lights, so he got infused on a Friday, and then he went and coached. Friday night under the bright lights and he came in Monday for his first treatment and he looked like a roaster chicken. Oh no. Yeah. I mean, he got over it, but you know, he had, he had, you know, first degree burns from doing this. And okay. so they, they're treated just like any other burn. Um, but that's the only case I've ever had like that. But most people, they're pretty vigilant and to the point where probably more so than they even need to be, which is good with me. Um, but you slowly, you know, if you're in your house, just as an example, I tell people you don't, um, you know, they give you all this information, but you don't have to be a vampire, have all the lights off. I just tell people, you know, do things with common sense. If you're in the house the first week after the treatment, you're in the house, you can have the blinds open. You're just not in direct sunlight. Um, you know, I've had people where we've literally scheduled it after vacations. Um, they said, oh, I've got a vacation planned and we're going to the beach, I said, we can do it afterwards. It really just depends, um, you know, so we we mitigate or limit your risk. That's all. And then over time, you know, you start letting in more lights. Um, you know, the, really the big thing that I worry about is I tell people you get to wear the big glasses like Liz Taylor. So, you know, you can avoid uh, just because I, I worry about the corneal injury more than anything. But that's true with anybody. But any UV light pair of glasses work. Um, if you want to go back to work the next week, you can. I tell people just try not to have, you know, bright overhead lights, things like that. Oh, who wants to go back to work? <laughs> so any other questions, folks? Now's your opportunity. My dog is. Okay. Love it. Okay, well, thank you so much, Dr. L. Would you please say your name so we know how to pronounce it? Absolutely. It's actually really easy. It's just, it's Lakshmi Narayanan, if you just break it in half. All right. Thank you very much. This was fabulous. I, I can't tell you how important it is for patients to have this extra tool. I had no idea this existed. So um, I, I thank you very much because we get a lot of lung tumors. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thanks, All right. everyone. All right. Bye. Bye now.